Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Should you share a database when working in a large system that's decomposed of many different services? Or should each service have its own database? My answer is yes and no, but it's all about data ownership. I explain a bunch of different scenarios and situations that come up when trying to answer this question. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So this video, like most videos, is actually spurred up by comments that I get from YouTube comments, so make sure to comment if you have any thoughts, as well as you usually end up posting some type of tweet that relates to this. And I got quite a bit of a reaction to this tweet of me saying that I'm curious how many people are developing microservices but share a database. And the key point of this, an integrate at the database level. And it's just a free for all. So I'm gonna keep elaborating here on that. And typically when you're a monolith, you have a client, some UI, interacting with some application service that's your monolith, and a single database. You can wrap all your database calls in a transaction with a correct isolation level to say prevent dirty reads so you can have consistency. And that's usually the point that people are really trying to get after here is the want consistency. And this is fairly easy when you have a monolith, again, because you have a single database that you're interacting with. The challenge with a monolith that most people experience is that because you have this massive schema potentially, and you have this giant monolith and there's just a, it is a free fall of accessing data and writing to data, it's hard to deal with coupling. Coupling becomes an issue. So what people end up doing is this idea of having multiple different services that contain certain set of functionality. Now this could be something physically hosted separately, but just logically, these are different uh, components, services that have different capabilities. Now the problem here is that if you have a single database, but each service is just a free for all to be able to access the schema from any different service where in basically there is no data ownership. This is really what I was referring to is that you have logically decoupled a system and decomposed it into multiple different services, but at the database level, it's just a free for all. So that's what I mean by integrating is that there is no data ownership. You still have just one massive schema ultimately, and any service can read and write to any part of the database. Now, if you hear me ever referred to a distributed big ball of mud or a distributed turd pile, this is really what I'm referring to because the problem here is that there is no ownership over the data and schema. So therefore, if there are changes to the schema, who's deciding to make those? Is it the service on the left or the service on the right? If you had 10 different services, who decides what can get changed if you need to say, add something to a table, for example, if you're using a relational database or a document store, if you're changing what that document is, who decides how that's getting changed? Because of this, things need to ultimately end up getting deployed all together because you're making some type of breaking change that every service needs to be aware of. That's often why I call this a distributed big ball of mud or distributed monolith or a distributed turd pile. Now I said at the very beginning intro that my answer was yes and no, because the question is, can you use a shared database? Physically instance, yes. Meaning that if each service owns a particular part of a schema and is the only one performing reads and writes on that schema, then yes, you can actually share the same database instance. This is just sharing that infrastructure. Imagine having just different physical databases on the same database instance that each service owns. You're just sharing the underlying database instance. Think about it like sharing hardware. That doesn't just mean that you can't go have one service directly communicate with the schema and the data from another service. No, that can't happen. But so yes, you can share a database, but there still needs to be data, uh, data ownership and segregation of that data. So once people go down the road of saying, okay, I get it, I want data ownership and I wanna have separate schemas and data ownership, but what ends up happening now is when they define these service boundaries and their specific databases, they start saying, okay, well, I need data from one service to another. So this ultimately leads to a client interacting with multiple different services. And when it makes a request, maybe that service says, uh oh, I don't have the data I need. So I'm gonna go call another service to get some data or to perform some type of action so that it can interact with its database. Oftentimes these are exposed kind of these service to service uh, communication just over HTTP and HTTP API or gRPC or something of this nature. But this is kind of the path people end up going down
is, okay, I need data. I don't have it in within my service boundary. How do I get it from another service boundary? Now I'll have some links in the description, but this service to service communication can be really challenging because you don't know when you're calling another service, if it's calling another service. There's a pile of issues here in terms of latency, availability, fault tolerance. It, this can actually turn into a complete nightmare of all this service to service direct RPC communication. But the question is, why do you need data from another service? Every time this comes up in comments or on my Discord server for members, check out the links in the description to become a member on YouTube and Patreon to get access. This always comes up in the sense of, because I need data for some type of query UI composition. Most of the time that's the case. Meaning that I have a client request come in that it needs to ultimately make some call to some service, but I need to compose this data to return it back to the client and I don't have all that data. So I need to expose some API in another service where I can go get that data, return it back, I can do that composition, maybe get my own data at this point, and then I can return that back to the client. But like I said, service to service communication, direct RPC blocking can be really challenging. So what people ultimately end up starting to do, or one option they get, is to start doing event carried state transfer, which I have a video about as well. And the idea here is that you're gonna be using messaging via events to notify other services that state has changed within your service. That way other services can kind of have a local cache um, so that they actually don't need to do that direct communication. So from here, if something changes within service B, it publishes an event that contains all the state about the information about what actually changed. That way service A at this point can uh, consume that message, can be a consumer, and then store that locally so that it can have a local cache copy. So that way when a request comes in from a client, it doesn't need to make that RPC call necessarily anymore. It has a local cache copy of that data. Mind you, it's eventually consistent and that data is stale, however. Now another way of dealing with this is just doing it on the client itself. Because ultimately, again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do some composition. So to remove that service to service communication, rather what you're having is individual components owned by their respective services understand how to get data from the appropriate service. So ultimately, you're moving all that composition up to the client. But by that, I'm saying each component, as I'm defining here, a little piece of the UI box, that's still logically owned by its respective service. So this one could, uh, one piece of the UI could call one service, the other one could call the other service, and they each at that point get the data that they need to do that composition in the UI. The downside to this is the chattiness. If you, and this is where people then start gravitating towards things like GraphQL, because you're saying, I don't wanna have to make all these different UI calls um, to my backend service to get data to compose this page. And now where this naturally leads is to the option of having a backend for front end or an API gateway that does that composition there on the server. So what that looks like is that you have your UI making a single call to basically your gateway, your backend for front end, and it is understanding how to do that composition. So we still no longer have kind of that service to service communication and concurrently can make all these different calls. So we eliminated the chattiness basically on the client, um, but rather we're doing it kind of in that backend front end so that it can build up that particular view model or UI that it's ultimately gonna return back to the client. So the second half of this is commands. It's needing to perform some type of action, some type of capability. And the issue here is that if you have a call out to a service to perform some action, and it needs to call another service to get data for say validation purposes. So it calls the other service, it reaches out to its database, it returns that data back and performs the validation. The issue here is that you have stale data. The moment that service returned data to you, you have stale data. You don't have any consistency with the database you're trying to write to, your own database. So kind of the fallacy here is a lot of people think, oh, I have consistency because I made this RPC call and got data right away. No, it's still stale. It's still, it's still gonna be inconsistent. It's just gonna be as stale as the data if you were using event carried state transfer and had a local cache. Now, if you don't need consistency, yeah, having a local cache is fine. So be it. But if you do need consistency, 
That means that you need the data within the service boundary that's trying to perform that right. That's where you need the data ownership. And what a lot of this where this falls down to is just thinking of workflows kind of incorrectly. So this is my example of this. Let's say we're going through an e-commerce uh, checkout process. A lot of times people are thinking about kind of the flow of data going only to one particular service. So if you're going through a checkout process, you need to have kind of your shopping basket as well as your payment information. Now the thing is, is that instead of having everything directed to say one particular boundary and then having to use events or some type of communication to then pass that information to payment, really what you wanna be doing is directing the relevant parts of that checkout process to the correct boundary. So what that means is when you're going through that first step of saying, okay, I wanna check out, you can be contacting the, the ordering boundary and maybe it creates some uh, records about kind of where the state of your current checkout process. And then from there, as you continue on and you go to the kind of the payments page where you're entering credit card details, once you submit that information, now you're pushing that data to the payments. You could be specifying as well as kind of that identifier of what that checkout process ID is or your card ID or your order ID. So basically at this point, what you're doing is you're not necessarily charging the credit card, you're just recording that information to its database with some kind of shared identifier. Once you, the user goes through the final checkout process and says, yes, I've entered my payment information, my ship, all that good stuff, and I'm gonna place my order now, that's going back to ordering, it's going to then mark the order as kind of being uh, completed in a way of that you're going through the checkout process. And then what it can do is send a message to your message broker asynchronously to saying, okay, I've accepted this order. Now payments, here's the information that you need um, in terms of just the order ID so that you can look up the information you already have locally that then you can reach out to your database or to the payment gateway to actually charge the credit card. The key thing here is that you're making the flow of requests directly to the services that actually need the data. Don't send all the data because it feels like it's a part of a single workflow. There could be many different boundaries a part of a workflow. So should you share a database instance between different services? The physical database instance, sure. The actual schema and data, no. The moment you share that schema and actual data between different services, you lose all ownership. You have no idea who actually owns it that can actually make an actual change. If you do wanna make a change, that means that all other services, and do you know all of them that are actually accessing that data, that they need to update as well. This is what I was referring to as integrating at the database level. And this can be completely a nightmare. Hence why people recommend having your own database schema and that ownership. The problem then in lies is making sure that you get boundaries correctly so that you have the data that you need within a particular service boundary. So that if you perform some type of action, that you have all the data that you need, that you don't need to reach out to another service, which ultimately you're just gonna get stale data anyways. If you wanna get access to a private Discord server where you can communicate some of these ideas with other like-minded developers, check out the links in the description to how to join. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.